Okay, this is gonna be about how to prevent osteoporosis. And I'm gonna start out by telling you some stuff I don't think you heard before. There's a lot of stuff on osteoporosis. It's a big topic. And at the end, I'll start covering stuff that I think you probably heard before, but we'll start with what's most likely gonna be most interesting to you. First of all, the, the first thing is philosophy. Okay, again, why do I like McDougall? Because he gives you a coherent rationale to understand disease and to avoid disease. And I'm gonna to try to do the same thing here. You wanna be like Adam and Eve with indoor plumbing and heating. So what that basically means is humans are designed pretty much to walk around in extended family groups all day, looking for food, helping each other out, eating stuff that grows outside, plant foods, okay? You get your sunshine, you get your exercise, that's makes us healthy. All right, when you start getting too modern, you end up all screwed up. And you know, also you don't wanna be hypochondriac. The kind of people that are always going for all these tests, I don't see you know, impressive health in them. I see impressive health and vitality and robustness in people who live in a healthy way. You know, eat what you're supposed to eat, get your exercise, get your sun, manage your stress. All right, so here we go. Uh, I'm gonna talk about the spine and I'm gonna get into a little bit of detail on it, but I think this will help you what I, to understand the spine in what I believe is an intelligent way. I'm also gonna tell you, I think most doctors know almost nothing about the spine. Even a lot of doctors who work with the spine don't know that much about it. Because the stuff that's in the standard textbook I think is pretty Mickey Mouse. I've written an entire book on uh, theories of uh, spine pain. I used to run a spinal injection clinic doing uh, spinal epidural steroids, you know, translaminar, transferaminal, all that stuff. I did tons of spine biopsies. Um, I have a lot of experience uh, looking at spine MRI and interacting with back pain patients and with neurosurgeons, orthopedic spine surgeons, you name it. So I'm going to tell you, and also being around athletes and helping people recover from injury. So I'm going to tell you things that I think will help you. All right. So one question is how do you avoid osteoporosis? But the other question is really how do you avoid problems with your spine in general? All right. So the first one is avoid atherosclerosis. And trust me, when I tell you something, I mean it and it'll help you. It's a big mistake. I constantly find myself talking to people and they look at me like I'm, I'm from outer space or something. And it's sort of, um, you know, it's the old Hollingsworth dilemma. If, if you're more than 30 IQ points above one person than the other, they just think the, the person who's telling them intelligent stuff is just being weird or autistic or something like that. No. This is how the spine works. It needs blood flow. The disc spaces are alive. They run on anaerobic glycolysis. So you have to give them oxygen and glucose. Well, you have to give them not oxygen. You have to give them glucose. And you have to walk to get the nitric oxide vasodilator going. I'll, I'll show you in the picture what that all means. Um, actually, let me go to the picture and then I'll come back. All right, so here's your spine. This will be the sacral vertebra number one, number two, and number three. Here's L5, lumbar vertebral five, L4, lumbar vertebral four, and L3. The abdominal aorta runs right in front of the spine, gives off lumbar arteries. They run mid-height of the vertebral body, then they give a little twig upward. This is called the upper end plate of this vertebral body, L4. This is the lower end plate. The upper and lower end plates arise from cartilaginous bones, so it's not that well vascularized to begin with. And then it's only through diffusion to the disc that nutrients get to the disc and waste products are removed from the disc. Again, the disc is alive. It runs on anaerobic glycolysis. So even under the best conditions, it doesn't get that great of blood flow. When you're walking, you kind of milk the nutrients in and milk the waste products out, and that keeps your spine healthy and strong. Now, what happens with aging, you know, people that eat high-fat diets, which is most Americans, they get atherosclerosis, especially on the posterior wall of the abdominal aorta. That stenosis and includes the lumbar artery, which then drops the blood supply to the lumbar artery and then drops it to the end plate. So then the disc is being deprived of its glucose, which it needs to maintain itself, and it's less able to clear out its waste products. When the disc can't clear out its waste products and get enough glucose to maintain itself, the outer part, which is like a steel belted radial tire, it's called the annulus fibrosis, that will start to fail and it will crack. 
when the annulus fibrosus cracks, the nucleus pulposus will leak through the crack. It's typically called an annular fissure. It used to be called an annular tear, but the term tear kind of has implication of potentially being post-traumatic, which it is not necessarily post-traumatic. So for medical legal reasons, they don't use that word anymore. I call it an annular fissure. But the point being is the center of the disc is like a jelly donut. So outer part's like a steel belted radial tire. The center part inside is like a jelly donut. And when there's a crack in the annulus fibrosis, the jelly donut nucleus pulposus will leak out through that. And that's your typical disc herniation. It starts out as an annular fissure. When it bulges back in here, then it's called a disc herniation. Um, if it's just at the level of the disc base, it would be a disc protrusion. If it goes up above the disc base or down below the disc base, then it would be a disc extrusion. Okay, once this jelly donut in the center here, the nucleus pulposus is in the center right here, dries out. After it leaks out, it'll start to dry out. That's called disc desiccation to dry out. The disc will lose height. Now, the disc is between the two vertebral bodies, and it's sort of like this sponge that um, balances the weight distribution. It supports a lot of the weight. And when the disc fails, now the disc can't support the weight and more weight is on the bones. Because the bones are holding more weight, they'll start to form bone spurs. Bone spurs are called osteophytes. And the osteophytes will protrude out. I'll show you a picture in just a second from below and from above. And eventually those osteophytes will grow towards each other and they will fuse with each other. What's happening is the spine has its own intelligence. Its job is to protect the central nervous system, the spinal cord and the exiting nerve roots. So it has a lot of proprioceptors and it senses when there's abnormal motion. They'll get at, you'll get abnormal motion when the disc is not doing its job properly and the annulus fibrosis is cracked. So it starts to say, hey, we got a problem here, abnormal motion, lay down some calcium, let's fuse this segment to protect the abnormal motion from becoming more exaggerated and potentially injuring the nerve roots of the core. So, and they also say like, you know, the hedgehog has only one trick, but it's the best trick. The point being is it'll roll into a ball, but what the spine does is it has one trick. It lays down calcification that becomes bone, becomes osteophyte. That bone spur is called an osteophyte. When you get a whole bunch of bone spurs going up and down the spine, that becomes called DISH, diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis. So the disc space failing, leading to more weight on the bone above and below the failed disc, and then they form bone spurs that grow up to each other, and then those will eventually fuse. I got a picture of that. Okay, so here is dish of the lumbar spine and of the thoracic spine. So this is L5, L4, L3, L2, L1. Now we're thoracic. T12 for thoracic 12, T11 for thoracic 11. Okay, so you can see these discs are uh, growing up from L5, down from L4, and now they're fused here. And as they start to fuse, the disc will bear more and more weight. Whatever bears weight in the body becomes more heavily calcified, more heavily ossified, but this creates a new problem. The vertebral body just in front of, just behind the bridging osteophytes of DISH, diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis, will now be bearing less weight. So you're going to get, that's called to bear less weight because something else is bearing your weight for you. It's called stress shielding. So you're going to get stress shielding in the anterior parts of these vertebral bodies. When you're stress shielded, bearing less weight, you're going to have less bone mineralization, meaning you're going to become osteopenic, diminished in bone density, and subsequently osteoporotic, more advanced diminishment of bone density. And so that's why these patients will be at increased risk for fractures in these bones. And so what I'm telling you too is this can be tricky. You can get these bone spurs growing out on the side of the bone, and they can throw off your bone mineral density measurements and you can still get a fracture in these bones. So what I'm trying to say is, don't focus so much on a bone mineral density. Yes, of course, talk to your doctor, do whatever you're supposed to find. But what I'm telling you is be intelligent. Try to be healthy, try to avoid atherosclerosis, and you'll have a strong, vigorous, energetic spine, much more likely. Okay, and I'm also mentioning there is a pitfall. You can get an artificially increased measurement on a bone mineral density if you got a lot of these bulky osteophytes sticking off to the side, getting incorporated into the measurement potentially there. So by avoiding all the atherosclerosis risk factors, you will lower your risk of getting degenerative disc disease, which then lowers your risk of getting bridging osteophytes, which then lowers your risk of stress shielding and subsequent osteoporotic-related fracture, okay? And with time with DISH, you'll also start 
getting uh, bridging osteophytes posterior. That's called ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament. You'll get calcifications of the disc base causing the vertebral bodies to be fused to each other because it's the bodies that are fusion, fusing. That's an inter-body fusion. So what I'm basically talking about here isn't about raising your bone mineral density five points or something. What I'm talking about is making your entire spine healthy. It's like the smart thing to do. Okay, let me go back to the first slide and now I'll go back through a lot more of the word slide type stuff. Okay, so here is that the words of what we were just talking about. Atherosclerosis in the abdominal aorta, the lumbar artery, causes ischemia, lack of blood flow to the spine, causing the disc to fail from degenerative disc disease. That can be painful in and of itself. Bone spurs form. The bone spurs can fuse. It can throw off your bone mineral density measurements. When the bone spurs fuse, that can also be painful or experienced as spine stiffness. The spurs support the weight. So the VB, vertebral body, is not supporting as much weight. It is stress shielded. Because it's stress shielded, its, it's bone density, its bone strength drops, and it becomes osteoporotic, softened bone. You can start herniating the disc into the vertebral body end plates. That's called a Schmorl's node. Usually those only hurt for a couple weeks, but sometimes they can be more painful. Sometimes chronically, though, they're not even causing any symptoms at all. But they can be a predisposing risk factor to progression and leading to a compression fracture. So this is a key thing. Ischemia, lack of blood supply to the spine, predisposes to this whole cascade of degenerative disc disease, bone spurs, stiff spine, osteoporotic spine, and even potentially to uh, toxic fractures. That's, a, that's an end-stage spine. But I let you know about all that because hardly anybody knows anything about that. Most spine docs don't even know about that. Most neuroradiologists don't know about it. I described it. I mean, there was descriptions of lumbar spine atherosclerosis-related disc base disease. That's been in the literature for a while. But I've described, and I wrote an entire book about it, ischemic spine is the most common cause of back pain and how it extends all the way from the sacrum on up to the skull base through the thoracic spine and the cervical spine. And OPLL is just more the same thing, but it's posterior in location. And same thing with interbody fusion. And I used to read when I was a resident, oh, this is rare, OPLL, something you see in Asians, BS. I see it all day, every day. And it's just a traction phenomenon. Well, it's primarily a traction phenomenon related to all this other stuff, degenerative disc disease and disc base failing. Okay, so don't eat any meat, not one bite. It's all atherogenic, and that includes dairy, no dairy. Now I'm going to get to more stuff that nobody practically knows. And when I say nobody practically knows, I mean I talk to spine doctors every single day, and I'll bet you none of them knows about this stuff unless I've told them, okay? All right, so the next thing, only eat organic. There's a lady out at MIT. Her name is Stephanie Seneff. She's a PhD. She wrote a book called Toxic Legacy. She's a very smart lady, and her research suggests that Glyphosate, the herbicide, abbreviated GP here, can substitute for glycine. So think of it as being glycine with a phosphate group stuck on it. And it can interpose itself, according to her, into proteins and substitute itself for glycine. Now, do you think that matters? Major big deal. Collagen, which is the glue of the body, the most common protein in the body, it's a triple helix. So three coils are wrapped around each other like an extension bridge, like the Golden Gate Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco or something. This triple helix coil has a tight wrap around itself. I can't even make it with my hands. But the point is, you need glycine to wrap that coil real tight. And this thing, glyphosate, because it's glycine-like, it can sneak its way into the protein. But because it's got that bulky phosphate on there, the protein will not be tightly wrapped and as strong as it should be. And she believes that substitution of GP in for glycine Glycine has the smallest R group, side group of any amino acid, just a hydrogen. So Senef is saying that she thinks that the glyphosate substitution for glycine is messing up collagen proteins. And that's a big deal. Because if the whole glue of your body is weak, your body's a lot weaker. Okay, your spine is a lot weaker. And if the connective tissue, uh, collagen is your connective tissue. It's a soft tissue, but it can be very strong. If the collagen, and related to the ligaments of the spine too, if the collagen is weak and not able to do its job correctly, that puts more stress on the spine and can lead to injury and pain in the spine. Okay, another way people's spines are screwed up and nobody knows this. What I'm telling you, I don't think I ever met a doctor in my life that knows what I'm about to tell you. F minus in water is really high electronegativity. It's super hyper reactive and it's super small. 
you know, similar to the hydrogen in size, and it'll latch on to collagen. It'll weaken the collagen. It is associated with dish, dish like osteophytes, diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis. That can lead to back pain in your spine. That can lead to this similar related cascade of stuff, bone spurs, bone spurs fusing, stress shielding of the VB, VB osteoporosis related to stress shielding, subsequent increased risk of fracture. So my opinion, have a, you know, at least a reverse osmosis filter for your kitchen if you got F- minus in your water. The best option is move someplace with no F- minus in the water, like with well water. Test the well water first, make sure it's good. That would be the perfect solution. Okay, but just so you know about it. So those are three things that can really screw up a person's spine. All right, now a lot of this other stuff is going to be just like what we talked about for avoiding kidney stones. And for avoiding kidney stones, and by the way, you'll search all over the internet. You won't find these things. You'll have a really difficult time finding them. You can find them. They're in the medical literature, but they're going to be subtle, and um, I think they're good to know. All right, uh, things that cause kidney stones, quite often they're thought to be leaching uh, calcium from the spine, excess dietary sodium, excess dietary caffeine, excess stress because it's going to increase cortisol, sleep deprivation increases cortisol, corticosteroid medications uh, are, you know, increase cortisol-like effect and will cause uh, removal of calcium from the spine through the osteoclast. Um, the Dr. McDougall newsletter had something interesting. His uh, newsletters are quite good. The one from February and March 2022 he even recommend avoiding uh, like isolated soy protein because that caused calcium loss. You know, soy protein has some similarities to animal protein. It increases insulin-like growth factor more. That's a whole other topic. And one thing I thought was funny, he actually recommended most women probably shouldn't even be getting a bone mineral density test, which I thought was kind of funny. You can read his newsletter for yourself. Uh, you might find it helpful. Eat whole food, 100% vegan diet. Yeah, that'll prevent. That'll minimize your risk of atherosclerosis. That'll give you more vitamin C, increase your chance of having good, strong collagen, the connective tissue that glues everything in the human body together, the most common protein in the human body. Get your sunshine, you'll have good vitamin D, that'll optimize your metabolism of calcium, so it'll be the way it should be. Get your exercise, that'll maintain bone mass, keep you strong. Okay, we got a couple more things here to talk about. Here's a slide. I, I skipped it earlier. I'll just show it to you now. Protrusion is when the disc bulges posteriorly at the level of the disc base height. That's a protrusion. If it goes up above the disc base, so this is disc base height above and below, that's called an extrusion. And it's almost like a code word from the radiologist to the surgeon saying, this is a bigger deal. You might need to do surgery on this versus a protrusion. The implication is unless it's big, and sometimes they are real big because they go quite far posterior, it's less likely to need surgery. Here's a Smorl's node where the bone is soft and the disc is herniating into the vertebral body. So a Schmorl's node is a herniation of the disc into the vertebral body. They're pretty common. Um, and that usually implies there's, you know, the bone is a little soft there. Oh, and here I show epidural lipomatosis. I see this a lot too, almost every day. Person you know, has too much dietary fat and they're, they're depositing fat inside their spinal canal. So that's not good. So it's another point that these high fat diets have consequences. You know, and depending on the baseline anterior posterior diameter of the spine, they can only tolerate a certain amount of fat before it starts to compress the dural sac and becomes more likely to cause symptoms. Okay, now we're going to talk a little bit about the Bantu uh, population in Africa. And basically, they typically will have nine children. And the lady will typically nurse the child for two or more years. Bantu women get hardly any dietary calcium, about 350 milligrams of calcium per day, like around one cup. And the reason why this is funny is because despite the fact she typically has about nine kids and nurses them for years and gets hardly any dietary calcium, they don't have any problem with that with osteoporosis. <laughs> they eat a primarily plant-based diet. So that's what's funny. You know, the American woman, she'll have, you know, one or two kids taking all these calcium supplements, driving herself crazy with all this dairy. And she's the one who gets osteoporosis. So eat less meat, you know. So I thought that was kind of funny. I mean, she's basically draining her calcium. Uh, she's nursing for years. Isn't that funny? Okay, so... Couple other thoughts on the Bantu women. Um, only 350 milligrams of calcium per day. Like I said, many westernized women are getting over a thousand milligrams per day. Um, 
Let's see. Oh yeah, watch out for calcium supplements. I, you know, I'm I'm not a big fan of calcium supplements. I think there's a lot of problems with them. I talked about this in my postmenopausal female death spiral lecture video. I made a video on that. Um, some of the problems, you're potentially not going to be making as much of your vitamin D active, and there's a lot of benefits to the active form of vitamin D. It hasn't been shown from my reading of the literature to cause a significant improvement in fracture risk. Um, some paper even said increased hip fracture risk. Can cause transient postprandial hypertension, transient postprandial making the blood more prothrombotic, which increases the risk, it is thought, of myocardial infarction. Um, and it increases all-cause mortality. Okay. So we talked about avoiding meat. That's a big risk factor for osteoporosis. We talked about it in my prevent uh, kidney stones lecture, the sulfur amino acids being acidotic and the theories of how that'll cause calciuria. And there's different theories of it, but the bottom line, it's associated with osteoporosis. Um, avoiding dietary sodium because that leads to more calciuria and thought to be leaching calcium from the spine. And then we talked about those other things, and I think that's about it. Oh, um, check out McDougall's newsletter. And I think that's it. I'm pretty sure it is. Yep. So anyways, I uh, hope that's helpful for you.